Sometimes, isotopes of different elements can be unstable. What that means is that there's something about them that needs to change. They, they can't live according to the current laws of physics, so they need to change something in order to be able to exist. Maybe there's an imbalance of forces, but a really simple way to think about it is they're unhappy and they need to change. So, when an unstable isotope changes to achieve stability, we call that nuclear decay. When that decay happens, it will release energy, and the name we have for that energy that gets released is radiation. Radiation is actually extremely common. Um, light is an example of radiation. It's radiation being emanated from the sun. Uh, infrared is radiation. Ultraviolet radiation is what tans our skin. Uh, radio waves are electromagnetic radiation. It's the thing that we use in Wi-Fi, cell phone towers, Bluetooth signals. So the problem with radiation can come in in that when you just spit that energy at other atoms, it can ionize them. That's what can cause damage in us if we interact with radiation the wrong way. If we get too much radiation, then atoms in our cells, in our DNA, can become ionized. And remember what ionizing means. It means that we change the number of electrons. So I've got an example here of lithium. When lithium is ionized, it'll lose one of its electrons and become lithium plus. This cation, this lithium plus cation, would then undergo different chemical reactions with different materials that are nearby. If that happens in something like our DNA, that would cause our DNA to break and mutate, and that could lead to something like cancer or an autoimmune disorder. So we're going to look at three different examples of radiation. There are more examples, but we don't need to go into more complexity right now. In these three examples, we'll look at three different examples of unstable isotopes. In these three examples, we'll look at examples of unstable isotopes achieving stability and releasing that radiation. We're going to look at how we draw, how we write the symbol for that kind of radiation. Each one has a unique way. We're going to look at how we model that, how we would draw that out. We're going to look at the strength, and the strength of that radiation is really how well it's able to ionize other atoms. That's really what it comes down to. Then we're going to look at the range and the barriers. What, what can block that type of radiation? All right, so first up is alpha radiation. Alpha radiation is going to occur when we have a really large isotope, something that has a lot of neutrons and protons. We'll use uranium-238 as our example. When we write our symbols for this kind of process, we want to write our atomic number down here and our atomic mass right here. That's going to allow us to keep track of how these things change. We'll see that very clearly once we write out how this alpha radiation is going to go about. In order to achieve stability, this element, this isotope, is just too big. It needs to lose some mass. In order to lose some mass, it's going to lose some neutrons and protons, and when it spits those off, it's going to spit off the most stable amount that it can, a good mixture of both. When it spits that off, what actually comes out is going to be two of each. So we're going to have two protons and two neutrons. Now what is that? Two neutrons and two protons? Well, that's a helium nucleus. This right here, it's just a nucleus of helium. Now, it doesn't have any electrons for itself, and that's going to be the problem. But helium is just going to be an atomic number of two, an atomic mass of four. So when alpha radiation happens, just spits off these, these little bits, these, these um, protons and neutrons. And when that happens, it's going to change the identity of that isotope. Okay, I've clearly made this one much smaller just to exaggerate it, but it's so that we can see that when we lose that alpha particle, we actually lose mass. And so what I've taken here is I've taken uranium-238, I've lost 4 off of my mass, so what's that going to be? 238 minus 4 is going to be 234. 234. And I've taken my, my atomic number of 92 and I've subtracted 2. I've lost 2 protons. 
Remember, the proton is what gives the element its identity. So we're going to have a different element now. So 234 and 90, what element is going to be 90? Well, that's going to be thorium. That's a capital T-H. So when alpha radiation occurs, we have a really big isotope losing some mass and becoming a new element. So thorium is going to be more stable than uranium in this case. So what's our symbol for alpha radiation? It's going to be the helium nucleus. And we want to draw that 2 and that 4. And that's how we're going to keep track of these changes. Really all we have is a little bit of very simple algebra on the top and on the bottom. We can really draw a dividing line here. We can draw a line right through this. And we can see that I've just got 90 plus 2 to 92, 234 plus 4 to 238. So just some simple addition and subtraction. Now how, what's our model for this going to be? Well that's just going to be these two protons, these two neutrons. What's our strength? Well if we think about it, this helium, it doesn't have any electrons of its own. So it's going to be a positive 2 cation of helium. Now helium is, is small, this is going to be the inner shell, so it's going to be really easy for that atom to pick up other electrons and steal them from another atom. So if I've got that lithium atom over here again, as this little alpha particle just flies right by, it's going to pick up this outer electron. And so what are we going to have after that? So after this helium flies by and steals that electron, instead of a helium 2 plus, I now have a 1 plus, just 1. But my lithium has now been ionized. So that strength, that helium atom, is going to be really strong. In fact, it is the strongest of these types. So we're going to give it the first place. What about its range? Well, the helium atom is actually going to be pretty big compared to the other two types of radiation. And so it doesn't take it very long to knock into something else and take some electrons. So its range is actually going to be really, really low. So it's, got a, it's going to be third place out of these three types. So when I say that range is really low, how far are we talking? Well, let's look at the barrier for that. Alpha particles can be stopped by just a few centimeters of air, by a piece of paper, or just by your outer layer of skin. So even if you were near something that was giving off alpha particles, it wouldn't be any health risk to you, because they're just going to slap your top layer of skin, ionize something really quick, and be done. If you really were worried about it, you could just cover it with some paper, and the paper would absorb all that radiation, even just something as thin as tissue paper. So what's our barrier? one to three centimeters of air, paper, or skin. The second type of radiation is beta radiation, or beta decay. Beta decay happens when we just have the wrong mixture of protons and neutrons. So it's not going to try and lose a bunch of mass. The isotope is going to just try and change one of those neutrons to a proton, or vice versa. We're only going to look at the neutron to proton, though. When this happens, something like carbon-14, which has six protons and an atomic mass of 14, that means it has eight neutrons, is going to be unstable. This has the wrong mixture. It really would like one of those neutrons to become a proton. And so that's what it's going to do. But how does that happen? I need one neutron to become one proton. In order to do that, that neutron is going to release some energy and part of that energy is going to be an electron. And that's what that beta particle is. It's going to be just one little electron. So when we lose an electron, what's the charge on an electron? It's going to be minus one. So carbon-14 is going to lose one electron. And we're going to write this just the same way. We're going to use our nuclear notation here. So that electron, what's the mass of an electron? For all intents and purposes, it's zero. So we're going to write a zero up top. So it's not going to change our mass number. But it does have a negative charge. It is going to change our atomic number. So we're going to have a minus one 
for that. So this neutron is going to become a proton, which changes the number of protons, which is going to change the identity of that atom. So carbon has six. It lost a negative one. So really, we added a proton. Because when you minus a negative, you add. What are we going to have after that? Well, this six is going to become a seven. But we didn't lose any atomic mass, so that's going to stay the same as well. What has an atomic number of seven? That's going to be nitrogen. And nitrogen at an atomic mass of 14 is very stable. So this carbon was able to emit an electron, which is a beta particle, and become a stable isotope of nitrogen. Once our carbon changes into nitrogen, it's going to release one little electron. Well, as that electron travels around, what's it going to look like when it tries to ionize something? Let's look at fluorine here. Fluorine is one electron away from being stable. So if this electron travels down, if it travels down and goes past that fluorine, that fluorine is going to snatch it right up, and we're going to have a change. And so when it grabs that electron, it goes from being a regular fluorine atom to a fluorine anion with a minus one charge. So that would, again, change its chemical compound. The trick, though, how much, how, what's the difference in strength between beta particles and alpha particles? Well, the alpha particle, remember, was a really big, strong helium nucleus. It was really quick to just grab an electron away from something else. Well, for, this, for something else to pick up this electron, generally it's going to want an electron. And so not everything is going to want an electron. It's not going to ionize everything. So its strength is actually going to be second it's not going to be as strong as that alpha particle. Its range, what's its range going to look like? Well, it's going to be able to get a little further because if we actually draw these a little closer to size. So even this isn't exaggerated enough to show the size difference between a helium nucleus and an electron. That electron is going to be so much smaller, it's going to be really easy for it to penetrate in between other atoms. So it's also going to be a little better. It's going to have a little more of a range. It's also going to be second. So it's funny, because beta normally means two or second. And it's the second place in strength. It's the second place in range. What are our barriers? How can we stop it? Well, it still isn't that... It's not able to travel that far. So our barrier, we can use one meter of air. It's going to be able to get through paper, but a strip of tin foil or aluminum foil, that would stop it no problem. So aluminum foil. And then the layer of skin is still going to be thick enough to stop it. So we can still say skin. So even beta particles aren't that able to penetrate. So let's write our symbol up here to complete our table. That was going to be an electron, just a little electron. Remember, it's got a minus one for that atomic number, because that's going to be how it affects that. And then it's going to have a zero for mass. But it's not going to change our mass at all. It's only going to change our atomic number. And then what's our symbol for that? It's using purple for electrons. So it's going to be a little, just a little electron. So the last type of radiation that we're going to look at is gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is a little bit different than alpha and beta in that it isn't going to release a particle. Gamma radiation is pure energy. In fact, it's actually the same thing as light, just with a lot more energy. So when gamma radiation gets released, it's going to get released because some unstable isotope found stability and just had so much excitement. It was just so, so unstable that when it found that stability, it just needed to get rid of a bunch of energy. It's like if you go through a really strenuous workout. Afterwards, you might just need to sit there and just breathe a little bit. That's kind of like what gamma radiation is. It's just that energy just getting released off. So when we denote it, when we, where our symbol for gamma radiation isn't going to have any mass, it's not going to have an atomic number, because it's not changing the mass. It doesn't have any mass. So we're going to denote it with zeros there instead, so that we know that it's not changing those. And then we're going to write a little Greek letter gamma, which just looks kind of like a Y with a swirl in it. How do we symbolize that? How, what's our model for that? Well, when we model out energy like this, pure energy, we use a waveform for that. 
So we draw it like this. As that gamma radiation travels, it's going to travel as a wave. Now, what's the strength of that? Well, the strength of gamma radiation, it's not that great at ionizing. Because the reason, the reason for that is that when it hits another atom like this, like this little lithium atom, the way it's going to ionize that is by trying to give this electron, one of these electrons, enough energy to leave. So it's not like the alpha radiation, which runs by and just steals that electron away. It's not like the beta radiation that's just going to fly by and get captured by this, this uh, atom. It's going to have to energize this electron as it strikes this electron, it's going to get it more energy, that electron's going to start to vibrate and move around a little bit more than it was, and if it gets enough energy to finally shoot off, then lithium would get ionized. So now lithium would be ionized to a lithium plus cation. But that's going to take quite a bit of energy, so its strength is actually going to be third. What about its range? Well, the problem with gamma radiation is its range. Even though these two are stronger ionizers, their range is really minuscule, so it's not that hard to protect against them. But gamma radiation, it's light, so it travels at the speed of light. And because it doesn't have any mass, it's not going to get blocked by anything else. It's not going to hit something and stop. It's going to keep on going through until it gets absorbed, until it ionizes enough stuff. So its range is going to be first. And when I say first, I mean its range, it's like there was no competition at all. It is able to go so much farther. While these were able to be stopped by some air, gamma radiation is not going to stop through the air. So it's not going to be stopped by the air. So what's it going to get stopped by? It needs something denser, something more dense. It needs to hit enough stuff to get absorbed. So it's able to be blocked by denser materials. But it still doesn't need that much of those materials. It can be stopped by lead, so we're going to say it's a greater than one meter of lead, which greater than a meter of lead, that's pretty hard to come by. But the next one, not so much. Concrete, that's pretty common. And besides concrete, what else? It's actually water. Now that's where the trick is. So in nuclear power plants, when they want to block against gamma radiation, what they'll do is they'll put the radioactive material in a lead container, in a, put it in a pool of water in a concrete building. So it's definitely going to absorb all of the radiation. There's no way that's getting out. So our symbol again was zeros because it's not going to change the atomic mass, it's not going to change the atomic number, and then the Greek letter gamma. And then our model is going to be just a wave. Okay. So, just like any other power source we have, just like electricity or gasoline, radiation can be dangerous. But, if we understand it, and we understand how to block against it, it can actually be made to be quite safe, which is why things like nuclear power plants are really a great benefit to modern society. We're able to stay safe from something that could be dangerous, and generate a ton of energy and power from that. So next we're going to look at what those nuclear power plants actually do. We're going to look at nuclear fission and nuclear fusion.